Read On is a European project which is being delivered through seven partner organizations across six EU countries, Ireland, Italy, Norway, Portugal, Spain, and the United Kingdom. The Irish component of the project is being delivered by West Cork Music and training for this activity was provided by Graffiti Theatre Company. This activity focuses on the development of skills for how to conduct an interview and analyze a text, facilitated interactions between young people and authors, taking an active role in presenting authors and their works to a broader public. Read On is undertaken with the support of the Creative European uh, Programme of the European Union and the Arts Council. Uh. Um, well, just hello and thank you for being here today. We all really appreciate it. Um, uh, so how are you? I, I'm very well. It's, it's a good Friday. So, um, yeah, I'm actually looking forward to this. I, I like this uh, setup. I especially like sharing ideas and thoughts with younger people. Um, yeah, so I'm quite looking forward to seeing uh, where the conversation goes. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> um, so uh, we're wondering if you'd like to read a piece from your book. I can. I was just wondering, was there any recommendations or would I just like, pick something? Um, just uh, pick something, your favourite part, if there is one. <laughs> Yeah. Oh no, you can't choose that. Yeah, but uh, uh, what actually? I'm gonna I'm gonna see which where I am. Oh, actually, I'm gonna read the bit of um, um, on Bior Talamala first, which means the the women who gather. Um, once there were old women who would travel the land carrying tightly woven willow baskets to gather the fallen bark of crab apple trees, wilting Saint John uh, for first plants and many fresh sweet fruits that they could find. They, pl they plucked the flax that they grew blazing along the roadside and the wool that snared on the thorns of brambles, hawthorn trees and firs. They dressed mostly in black where the edges of their garments were lined in, in red, white and yellow. Some of the women had additional stripes to the dress of different colours, one for each of their children living or departed. Their long hair was plaited in firm braids and about their hips were small beady pockets embellished with metal tokens and buttons that were tied. Every evening they would boil and dye the wool red in the big cast iron pot that rested in the campfire in the heart of the molly in which they lived. During the night, they would continue to spin and weave the cords or render them red for the young children. They would sing songs of hope and melodies of joy in a chorus of sweet voices that their minds of clear intent, stirring and carrying and weaving thoughts and prayers into the chords for the young. At dusk, they would gather. At night, they would labour. And as dawn came, they would rest peacefully in their bed. And this is how it was for a very long time. However, as the years wore on, more and more children were born and welcomed into the world. The old women who gathered began to struggle to keep the pace of their labours. They worked and worked and worked until the cords that were of red and the colour of blood, tones of teeth, fire and iron rust. Despite their struggle, they decided they would keep weaving the cords and then one day weave a cord long enough to encircle the entire world so that no child would be out of the care of a loving blessing. Dawn and dusk, night and day, blended into one as the work continued and the old women who gathered forgot to stop to, or eat or rest. Over time, their fingers, once kissed of pink, uh, pink, or soft pink from dye, became darker and darker. Some brown from the dust of the ashes, others black from the coal or from the well-stocked fire that kept the boiling, hot boiling or dying. Still, the old women who gathered worked on. The molly, once filled with songs and dances of joy, became silent as they focused more and more upon their task. The sweat of the brows began to wash away the red from the cords and they became a silken grey glossomer. In time, the cords began thinner and as, delega as delicate as filigree, but, as they, but at their core, they held their strength. Still, the old women gathered on and worked on and on and on. They grew thin and bony as they neither slumbered nor fasted or feasted and they began to shrink. Some of the old women who gathered worked one or two of their own fingers away, while others kept their gathering baskets tightly strapped to their backs, not bothering to take them off between gathering, dying, and weaving the cords. Their hearts remained warm and their tasks remained a focus. In time, however, the women grew smaller and smaller, less of this world and more of another, until one day they looked a little bit more than a bundling of fingers, spinning and weaving with their gathering baskets on their backs, adored with the stripes and shading that their once belonged to the dresses and beady pockets, and they had become the very first spiders. And even now they continued their work, spinning onwards and onwards across the very world. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I can speak for all of us when I say that was 
uh, great. <laughs> they uh, hurried, because I think when people tell stories that they're reading, the pace is different rather than if you're sitting beside me and set the scene, you know, there's a fire, there's a hot cup of tea, there's a little bit of a melody to it. So things, I think, the medium which you share changes how we share it, but I think the story is still a beautiful one. Hmm. Well, either way, I think we all loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so uh, I believe I will be giving you uh, your first question of today. Oh, fire ahead. Uh, yeah, so um, firstly, uh, when and uh, how did you actually get to starting just writing, really, in general? Uh, so I've always been a writer, or as I describe myself, a scribbler. Um, I usually have like two or three journals on the go. And it can be different things. I usually have a work journal for work ideas. And then I have like a random um, kind of journal that usually lives in my um, my satchel or under my arm. And I, I've always I've written, I write ideas and thoughts or you know, little quotes and funny and, 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 and almost ingenious things that the people say, I think is worth catching. So I've always written. And then um, I think many years ago, probably 2007, I started a blog. And that kind of, and it was, it was, it was a secret blog that I did never shared my name and it was out there in the world. And I got to try all these little ideas and thoughts and stories and opinions and arguments. And you just throw them out into the world. And that was actually really, it was really empowering because I didn't have to expose myself. I could just be there and see how I was reacting and play out new things. Um, Cause like us all, sometimes we forget how fragile our own egos are. So I, I got to play around with all these ideas. And I think that, there's a, there's a huge difference in people's minds between a writer and an author. And I think everybody is a creator. Everyone writes, and you may not write it in, with a physical script, you might write the ideas and thoughts, you might paint it, but everyone does create a story and a narrative. And the only difference that I can really see is that some people get published and some people don't. And that's not really always about value, that's about access and then, you know, into that world of publishing. So I think that um, it, it's something that we all do, we just do in different ways. And I just happen to have a flair uh, for turning the the oral rhythms into something that you can read with. Wow. That answers your question, I hope. <laughs> um, so you, you mentioned publishing it. Was it, um, uh, did you go about getting this book published or did someone approach you? Uh, it, interesting, it was a meeting of mine. So I had looked at, because um, I've hundreds and hundreds of stories I've written down over the years, and I looked around for someone to publish them. And my, one of my main kind of stresses were especially, like, and some of the stories have nothing to do with the, with the museum I'm from, but I didn't want to engage with any platform that had previously published narratives or stories or tales um, or about the community that were anyway negative, because I didn't want to be putting potential like additional resources into something that could be quite destructive. And when you look at the modern um, publishing houses here in Ireland, um, and there's not that many, many, you'd be surprised how many have published things you find questionable now. Um, so that, that automatically cut off some of the links. And what happened one day was to come across the, the publishers called Dean Press. They were, they were looking at um, publishing kind of lesser known voices, people of kind of the NB, the minority black or ethnic groups. And I had, I had, I had I suppose, host interest in them. And they actually ended up contacting myself. So it was like I was reaching out. And they were made, so I thought, <gasps> synergy, you know, synchronicity of the moment. And um, so I think that rather than one finding it, I think we happen to find each other. And it's something I'm actually delighted by. And it's also, I'm also quite fascinated how rarely people speak about their publishers. And I think that relationship for me was, is, is and remains very important. Um, you know, that like, the idea would be, I was coming in with a, what I would find to be stories I would hold very sacredly uh, within to myself and to my family, and they're very important. And I was very anxious about people skewing them for different ways. And so, and so I had the trust in the relationship of the people saying, no, we actually want to facilitate a voice rather than our version of the voice. And um, so I'm, I'm quite happy. So I know a lot of people find it very difficult um, to find, to find I suppose, avenues to be published. I didn't. And I know that, that in itself is quite a rarity. I mean, from some of my community, which there's a very little handful of people who have ever, ever been published, um, I'm, I, I consider myself quite blessed. So, I mean, with having like the fairly free reign with your uh, publisher, I mean, you must have been able to put in pretty much all the stories that you uh, wanted in the book. I but, mean, were, but, were there any stories? Oh yeah, so, so sorry, since, like books have, unfortunately have to be certain sizes. You know, there's a whole, there's a whole world of, of book selling and different lives going to be gone. The, the only painful part of the entire process, I, I know some writers slave and I'm not, I, I will not slave over words. I will not aggravate myself. I will not torment myself. Writing is a joy. 
Um, and I love the idea of a process because my process was I, I sat down and recorded the story. I then like muse them over, I re-record them, and then I turn them into start writing them down. And the difficulty was books had to be certain sizes. So there was stories that never made it. Um, that we had workshops on, we thought about it. And and that itself is you don't it's not about sacrificing like which story is better than the other story. It's what story has a feeling it wants to be heard right now. And there's no way I can really catch that. But there were certain stories I would thought I would never really that story doesn't really excite me. It's like it sounds interesting. And then when you hear from other people, for instance, the story I just read about the, the women who gather, I for many years, and it's really embarrassing recently, um, thought that story was actually about spiders. And in fact, that story is about the sacrifice of women, the, the labor, how it's overlooked. Uh, no, and there's all these other, and how hearing that story from a woman was like, I get it. That's, that, that has to be in the book. You know, that, you know, that, how could I not? You know? Um, so I think that rather than having this kind of linear process of, oh, we, we're going to select and choose and which needs, it was more organic, who, like, which ones are rising, which one felt didn't want to be authentically heard. And I think that's a dance that all storytellers uh, take part in, rather than going, I'm just going to pick this deliberately for this reason. They're the ones that just like whispered and I have to be in the, in the situation to, to hear them. And they lingered enough that I knew they had to write them. And they seemed to pull themselves together in the way they, they, that they did, that they ended up in the book. And I know, I, I know, and I also that absolutely sounds absolutely ridiculous. I did like I should have sat down and had a plan, but uh, I think it's part of the nature of travelers that we seem to go where we need to go rather than where we always plan. Yeah, um, because most of the stories they do have, well, they have you know um, a moral or a meaning behind them. Are there any stories where the morals you've that have really shaped who you are and you've really kept with you? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, and I say, see, a lot of the stories, I think we sometimes we forget that every story comes in a message, even if we can't hear it. There's always a narrative being shared. And in, in a lot of these stories come from my father. And and what, what often do fathers do to their children? They give advice. So that was always a very formative part of, so rather than me sitting down going, I'm going to like, tell the world how to fix itself. It was like, hang on, this, these were like life lessons. And sometimes if you tell people uh, so an instruction and guys. The world through stories they have more an opportunity to linger an example i often share with people would be um like there's a there's a plant called uh water hemlock that's quite it grows across the, the entire um country it's quite poisonous even to the touch and the pollen of it is quite toxic so when we were children we were told that it's called angel's breath because if you sleep beneath it angels whisk you away and to this day i know the size of that plant how dangerous it is so rather than someone sat down and make on a epilorium no this is the genetic season of it this is his latin setting name that's not going to find its, its, its own little roots in my mind. But by sharing that information in, I suppose, in a way that can uh, captivate my imagination, it was a way that it really, uh, I, suppose, I suppose, implanted in, in my mind in a way that was very organic, that I could, that I could return to. And I think that's part of the, um, I suppose, overall storytelling tradition. But I think all stories come with a sense of morality, even if we don't think it. So there's always a narrative being shared and a worldview and framing um, even if we reinterpret our own ways. But so I think that the way I was, I suppose, sharing them is how they were shared with me. And most stories are either to bring comfort, like the story of um, when, I, when I cut my hand, um, which I still have a scar from, that whole story of, of the, the strength and my father, it really knit it together um, a point of resistance to myself. Because uh, even when things happen now, a line that goes through my head is going like, uh, even, even to say a different trauma, um, like bright road is light blood. So the idea would be, it's only a small graze, not quite serious. No, like, like in life, like it's like bump of the road. And I think those types of experiences can really, I suppose, bring us harmony and positivity in ways we don't, we don't realize. Rather than reviewing a traumatic experience, we can make it a part of a story that, that will carry us through it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, you're <laughs> nodding. That's a good sign. I'm, I'm really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I mean, you, you said earlier there that uh, these stories and uh, choosing them in that process, and you chose the ones that you felt uh, you wanted to be heard today. So a lot of them have um, quite a deep connection to nature. Uh, would you say that you have a fairly strong connection to nature? Do you think? I helps? would, um, very much so. And I think it's part of our cultural setting as well. Is if you look at people from the, our, our community, vast majority of our time is spent outside in nature. Um, if you have like small homes, you have like small trailers, you have small wagons, you can, 
vast majority of the time it's outside. And there is a slight disconnect of people who spend the majority of the time inside that nature isn't something that's out there. Nature is something that's actually around us and a part of us. And, um, and sometimes that's actually found as well in our, in our language and our volume. We know that people from the traffic community are, at, are octave in the community slightly higher, um, which people often think we're just shouting and being quite loud, is because if you spend the majority of the time outside, this is going to like the most immediate generation, um, there's a lot of ambient noise, so people actually speak louder. You know, so, because, so the idea of people being very polite and whispering doesn't work when you're outside and there's wind and there's hail and there's animals. You know, so, it, yes, and I think that's a, it's a different way of it, but also I've always been absolutely fascinated um, with nature and the idea of somehow the, the majority um, Irish canon has lost uh, so many of its folk tales. It might be due to repression, occupation, you know, the, the whole thing. But like some people remember why the wren is king of all birds and why the robin has a red chest. And then what about the other stories? Like all these other communities and countries across the world, the storytelling is, is an innate kind of process, have stories of why that river got its name or why that mountain is a certain way and what's that called. And then we come to the majority population and that's lost. For the, you know, and it's still there, but the majority of people don't know how to find or reconnect with it. And with my community, um, that was it's still considered a very much a living tradition. And a lot of that is nature because the rain and nature is the great equalizer because the rain that falls on the trailer is the same rain that falls in a mansion. And it's a way of bringing a great equilibrium for experiences rather than feeling lesser, inferior or superior. So I think nature itself is, um, is something that brings me a lot of peace, but also it's universal. If I sit down and tell a story about a certain person, people may not always connect with it. If I tell a story about the moon, we all have a common base of connection. Yeah, yeah, I'd say almost in a way, nature is honest. That's also something I'd say about it. Um, when, uh, uh, when you were going about uh, collecting these stories and speaking to people, were there any stories that you found were repeated a lot uh, that came to a lot of people's minds first when you asked them about it? Yeah, yeah and... Um... First off, I would say I, I love the idea of, of nature being honest. Um, mm -hmm. But nature is honest in a really interesting way. Because I, I have seen the absolute wonder of dancing uh, dragonflies. And I have heard the terror of, of a rabbit dying in a meadow and the sound of it. So I think nature is so honest that we don't always see the beauty of it. And that beauty is a very raw one. But when it came to tales, there were certain stories I wanted to share, but out of family sensitivities, I couldn't. So I don't know, but I can share it kind of in, the, kind of in these settings, but this, the fact people didn't really want me to write about it. Um, so there is a record, there's a, there is a repeating story tale um, and experience in the Irish kind of chronicles around a man hunting who has a hair and the, the, the hair transforms into a woman and he's left shocked. That's actually an experience that my grandmother's um, brother, Jack, who we know affectionately as Jack the Hare, had. He, he was hunting with uh, his three brothers in the place called Corrafin in Galway. Um, he, the, the, there is there are, there are certain rules around hunting that you only hunt with one hound, you don't have two, and um, because you need the animal needs to have a fair chance to get away. Otherwise, you know, because you, you, otherwise you need to like nature needs its own balance. So he was he was quite hungry. He hunted with two hounds, and the hound was caught but got away. And um, one of the hounds and went into a bush. Himself and his brothers went into it after him, and he saw a woman in the bush with a cut leg, and he was convinced that that that, that hair had transformed itself into a woman. And he was hospitalized for 12 years. And when he removed from hospital, he still had a high level of, of um, you know, mutation so that he would very rarely speak. And I thought his story is an absolute, absolute uh, captivating. It's part of our family, it's part of our family history, it's part of our, even the, you know, our local community, it's part of that narrative of what can happen. And, and because he is like surviving heirs and the principi and people's names, like people thought going, it's okay to share that story. They just didn't want it write, written down. And uh, so, so there, there are certain sensitivities, but that was a story that came up quite a lot. And any story to do with transformation is quite important, um, that anything can change into anything because nature is always changing and life is always changing. And the idea that the only things that don't change are dead things. So the idea that a man can turn into a tree, um, or we know it might be a symbolism of a tree, but that is seen as, as a natural narrative of a force that that can happen if he can become rigid, he can, his life experience has become quite embittered and poisonous to people around him and to himself. And it was a way of explaining that, but the idea of transformation and, and you know and, and journey, it seems to be incredibly natural. And, and for a traveling people, I think that come, comes up quite a lot. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers the question. Oh, you're, again, you're yeah. nodding, I like it. Love it. Yes. 
Um, yeah, I mean, by the sense of it, there are just so many stories that, like, maybe not have even have made it into this book. You know, do you, would you intend to write a more short story collection? I, I do. I've been commissioned for three more books, um, mm -hmm. which is a ridiculous number. Um, mm -hmm. I'm right. The next section is a collection of traditional uh, folk tales that are um, horror stories, um, which I love. I love scary stories. Um, I think they bring out the best and worst of us. Um, and then there's a yeah, there is an illustrated book. Um, for young children, and um, where's the third one? Oh, yeah, there's another, there's another collection of stories around nature and the equi and equinox and the cycles of, of, the, of the, the land. And um, because again, I'm fascinated how so many people have disconnected themselves from the, the, the movements of the moon, the seasons, the festivals. Like for travelers, our festivals are still alive, the festival sound, like people go visit the graves before they go trick or treating. Um, like the, the whole festival of like the Lunasa, the whole the, the, the harvesting, the bringing of grain. So these are festivals that have existed for generations, generations, millennia here in Ireland that we very recently just abandoned. So I, I hope to encourage it. But also, I think that the book is an invitation to people, no matter what people's heritage is um, or connection, to start discovering their own stories. Like I am absolutely fascinated with, with the idea of going, you have stories in you, like you've been here, they just haven't shared. And you have ideas and thoughts and some may be born from your own head and other people may whisper them into your ears. And they're valid and they're real and they're important. And you, like, do you want to be the last person to inherit a story and not to share it, knowing that it came from a place of beauty and it came from a place of bias and it came from a place of worry and concern and joy and fun? And I think we, we have almost a responsibility to ourselves that we need to let our own selves live through those and share them. So I think that, that while there's many, many, many stories in the tribal community and many of them I have collected, I think that there's other people need to share their stories too because the, the art of storytelling it is an art because it's a creative engagement and it's something that everybody can engage with and absolutely blossom in if we only give ourselves a chance. Oh, I, I think that's a very nice way to put it. Yeah, it's like everyone has some story, may it be big or small, and I think it's really nice if people are able to share them. Um, uh, when you were, um, uh, sorry, this is a bit of a divert, but... Uh, when you were writing your books, did you have a certain sort of process? Would you write them inside, outside, day, night, or was it random? Oh, so um, I'm quite busy in life, so I have two jobs. Um, I manage an education centre and I'm an advisor in the Shannon. So what I, what I used to do is that I tried to carve out an hour of my life a day, just an hour. And I think sometimes when people come to writing, so they go, we're going to write for four hours a day, they're going to be Monday. That sounds incredibly painful. So I decided I was going to give myself an hour. And I would sit down and I, I, I would literally record them onto my phone. So I think there's a certain need to keep certain kind of linguistic forms that comes out in the writing because we speak differently than we write. So I wanted to be able to capture as much as I could that kind of the, the language and the flow and the, the pace and tenon of, the, of, 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 of myself but also the inheritance of the community. And that's how it started. But as life as it is, it's quite complicated. So I used to get up early sometimes and write. Um, the publishers are amazing. They took to well receiving re-edits at like 2 a.m. in the morning. Like they were like, it's fine. Thank you for like, keep engaging. And um, yeah, so I think that we always have moments. And you know what actually I had fun doing is that I might have sat down with my partner then and we might watch a movie and or something on television rather than something recorded. And ads are amazing. They're like five little minutes. And if you have five minute windows just to write ideas and thoughts, you'll write them. Because you know it's going to be over soon. It's a really short period of time. And there might be three or four in a movie. So you have these like little blocks of creativity. Your mind just kicks and goes, share, what's coming up? And then when you, you release it, you're not building up this pressure or expectation of, oh, we need to get this, we need to do that. So if you, I always found if I become a part of the flow, um, like structure is very important to me, but flexibility in that, that structure leads to a lot of creativity. If I was, if I had to, I suppose, rent a room um, Monday to Friday and had so many hours in it, I'd never go in there. because it, it would feel, like another job and I don't think the kind of the creative engagement has to be about employment and that kind of mindset it's something that I love and I like to share and it's something that I try to keep as spontaneous and fun as possible and um, so my I think that always have always strive for the hour a day which I do because I, I mean I'm, I'm, I'm right I have a need to write and I also like to write my dreams I think that I don't understand how people don't record their dreams every night you have this wonderful silly daft ingenious world that you just engage with and then you just get about it. Rather than going, go back to yourself, like you're, you're whispering ideas, you're facing terrors of yourself, you're looking at your own shadow, you're looking at your own hopes. So 
So five minutes in the morning, jot down a few ideas. Wonderful. Will I use them? I might. Um, is, it, is it lost to me that I wrote them? No. So there's no losing it. Each one has a benefit. I do think opening to structure and striving is important, but also having that flexibility to let the authentic voice rise rather than drag it out. So I, would, I would find that, which is not part of the best practice. And another best practice that I never watch myself at. So hello, Owen. Um, you're being recorded. You're never going to see this. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think that even when I receive the questions, I just scan them because you know, when we overthink things, we start trying to, to make them into something. It's almost like, oh, I'm going to try to make this, like, I'm going to say this back and I'm going to say this and have these generic pieces. I think when I do that, I become quite manufactured um, and you know, almost deliberate. And it just takes the, the flow and the rhythm and the, the joy out of it. So, um, yeah, so, so to, to take this long spiel, I'll just show it into a short one. Uh, structures to be strived for, creativity needs to be open. And by, by being kind to yourself as, as a writer um, and engaging with fun, um, I think that, that, that you will, if you're enjoying it, you will find the time. I'm just going to hop in for two seconds and say we've got time for maybe two more questions and then we'll open it to everyone else. So uh, just letting you know. Um, Good one. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm another uh, quick question about the kind of writing process, especially with this book in particular, uh, and maybe for the future um, picture book that you uh, uh, might be working on. Uh, how was it working with the illustrator of this book, uh, Leanne oh, McDonald? Oh, I love her. I love her. I love her. I love her. <laughs> and so I met Leanne in 2013. And in our first conversation, at the end of it, she said, you should write a book. And I said, someday I will, right? And there was, she never lies all these years later. I was like, yeah, you know. So actually part of her illustrations were actually a part of the tradition. So we had given her the, the stories, going, here are the stories, um, read the stories, and you know, hopefully you'll enjoy the stories. Now go off and do your version of the story. So you have your own medium, and, I, and there's, there's only very few um, limitations. Um, one is that I really want them to be in black and white, because I think people can color things in their own way. I think that gives a lot of creativity. Um, uh, two is I want them to just be born from her own ideas. I kind of go just do what you need to do and they're yours. And the third one is that I want them to be slightly wispy because I have strong memories of hearing stories around a fire where almost I would imagine that some of the stickers of the flame became my characters and that waviness to it. So I had this idea of going, I wanted to almost capture that within some of the pictures. They're going, make a black and Eyes, get people colors in, let it be yours. But it has that sense of, because the campfires are universal. And um, like everyone has this community has traditions of campfires and gatherings. But I just wanted these people to catch it. And so she listens to the stories, and those illustrations are her version of the story. And I absolutely adore them because they're not what I had in my head. You know, they're not, they don't fit here, but they fit in her head. And I go, these same stories that we've just shared have two so different images. That it shows that I like, going, and I love that rather than, especially you know, when we look at the, you know, the older stories here now, like things like the Cucullin, the Ulster cycle. I'm always very wary of a story becomes the story. And that's actually very damaging because how do you know that's the official version? There's such a thing as official version. Someone just happened to write it first. You know? I mean, you know, and then suddenly the first time you write it becomes the official version. And I think that's actually that's very limiting of the human experience and the people's creativity. And, and having her images in the book that don't always exactly fit story is so important because it shows that her imagination was working her, her insights was working away and she viewed the world and the landscape so differently and I think that's an invitation as well for people to say that's her giant or that's her spider what's yours you know because it doesn't have to match they're not supposed to because once the story leaves me and goes to you you're responsible for it now you can re-envision it you can share it you can embrace it in a different way and um yeah so I think that and I'm quite lucky because like we am with an absolute pleasure to work with um really I mean, she's a fine artist. Um, she's a trained artist. She is absolutely so much fun. Um, like really, like spontaneous energy. Um, yeah. So like, like the entire actually the entire process was really joyful. I mean, from writing it and listening to it, and there was those discussions over kitchen tables because I don't know about um, other people. Um, in my mind, I think I've told you the story because I know the story in my head. Doesn't mean I've actually told you the story. That maybe huge gaps missing. I'm going. I oh, actually yes, I know that, but I actually haven't told you. So a lot of times it was sticking down. When people go, look at, tell us a story, you tell a story, and you have a cup of tea, you're okay. And they go, how did he get to the castle? And you're like, oh yeah, I forgot that part, you know? So it was about just kind of someone teasing it out with you. So they become a part of the story of going, now, what happened there? I go, yeah, I forgot that part, you know? Um, another time, just kind of like going, 
but I'm going to change it. Because actually, when even like the book is actually in audio form. And one of the people I wanted to um, be part of was, was my father. And it was a very distinct voice. Um, and when it came to him reading the script, he could not repeat the same story twice. So we quickly learned on day one, that while he's an incredible storyteller, he cannot repeat the same story because the story was changing. He said, he's like, oh, no, this time the giant was beside the ocean because like, it fits now you know, where he's doing it. And um, yeah, so I think that, that's a part of the, the creative of it and also the people who are engaged with the entire process. I don't think it was just myself. There's memories of my family, memories of my community, input from people. There was, like, I, don't, I wouldn't understand say negotiation, but there's a nuanced sensitivity of, like I was naming people, I, I was naming the living, I mentioned the dead, um, there was experiences that people have known of, and you, like, you need to let people know, like kind of going like, there's a woman who is very dear to me, um, and she's known as Nanny Cat. Now she wasn't my grandmother, but she would be someone who would be a grandmother figure. And like, so you, there's a sense of going, Nanny Cat is in the book, here's like, here what I'm saying about her. So people weren't taking a thunder or surprise, um, but also would know that I would be treating the stories in a very open, authentic way, and because because there's there's a, there's there is I suppose there's a there's a proverb that people hear but never finish. We say don't take, don't speak ill of the dead, and the, the full version within the traffic community is don't speak ill of the dead, but don't lie about. Them. You know, and so so like so you have to you have to portray people as they are. And so while you have this creativity, especially if people are no longer here to, to defend themselves, you're going, yeah, that person was a character, aka we did not get on, you know, or like. You know, like, you know, like, or like, we never quite saw eye to eye, but never harmed each other, which means couldn't stand him, could, could not stand him, you know? but there's ways to be respectful about it. Well, yeah. I think you did a very good job portraying everything in your book. And I think we can all say a big thank you to Leanne for bringing such life to the book as well. Um, and when you were sharing the, this book, through your community, was there anyone who read it who was like, oh, I forgot about that story. Oh, how did I forget? That one was very nice. Yeah, and, and different versions came up. People had forgotten some tales, but also some tales had different versions. Um, and I love that because I need to share, but also I discovered and I never had fully realized that, um, that there's, there's, within the community, there's different lineage lines. And many of our lineage lines actually descend from, um, from the uh, female line rather than the father. And because you're only guaranteed to know who your mother is, there's no guarantee who your father is. Yeah. So many people will follow the female line. And some of these lines that no one owns the story, but there's a sense of going, no, that story is often found in the homes of the McDonough's. Or that story sounds like a Sherlock tale. You know? So there was, the, and it, no one says you can't share them, but there's, there's this building sense in me going, oh, different families have different genres or ways of telling stories. And it often reflects some of their work. For instance, like going, many, what many people know about Travers is Tinsmith Ring. And I find this absolutely fascinating because anything is about Travis, but the, the old style tinker, the tinsmith. And in reality, that's actually very limiting. So just imagine there's three families and they come to the same village and there's three tinsmiths. No one's eating because there's three tinsmiths and there's not enough work to go around. So we actually, in reality, people had loads of skills. So my family's main skills would have been um, herbs, so that people were involved with herbs, but also dyeing because of herbs. So they used to do uh, you know, fabrics. And, and they, because of that, they were also associated with seaweed. Um, so they used to gather seaweed and different items. So, so there's a lot of our stories about the sea and the land. And then there's some people's families who worked in some of the industries and building you know, the roadway, a road, um, railway. And so there's a lot of stories of like the death of the railway and the knocking at the hill of Kershire, which is the place in Kerry, which they forged um, a, um, a railway to a sacred site. So there's all these, so their family, it would come very, like my family wouldn't have that many stories of, of Kerry because we predominantly wouldn't have stayed in Kerry. But the families in Kerry would have those stories. You know? And, and like, I think the Puck Fair, which I, like, the idea that Puck Fair survives in Ireland now is amazing, where people catch a goat, crown him king. He becomes a king for a week. He's on a big stage in uh, Kilgorgan in Kerry. And how somehow that survives the scrutiny of a Roman Catholic church is fascinating for us. You know? It just shows you how alive folk tales, the folk custom, and that kind of sense of connection to older tales are, that even that even the church couldn't stop a crowning of a goat. <laughs> <laughs> so in rescue, in rescue, you know, Kerry. And um, yeah, so I think there are, there's slightly different lineage, but I think that the book itself has been an invitation for more people to write and describe. And there's some people who aren't writing, but are just recording the tales. 
And um, because I think well, the reality is like our stories are very well documented within academia. Um, but we just we just don't have access to most of them. Like one of the there was, there was a tale, there's a book called Shorten Road, which was, which was in the 70s by a family, and they're still around by the Camelchins as a husband and wife. And there's, there's many stories from the community there. When I was reviewing those with this, it was the surviving descendants of those families, they didn't realize that their family stories were in those books. So there's a lot of process around our people coming and mining our community for tales, and then we're not benefiting from them. Um, or the, a lot of the stuff is being recorded and it, 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 it remains outside of our access, which means we don't get to um, create them, we don't get to give them context. Um, so there's a lot of power dynamics there, but that's actually what's happened when you're from a minority community that has a long history of oppression within the community, within our overall society. Um, but yeah, I think that I, I've been incredibly overjoyed by the sparks I've written into people, but also the wonderful blossoming and burning flames that people brought to me with their own ideas and thoughts and connections. And that's, I think, something Traver or the wire community, we should be sharing because that light and that warmth illuminates and brings comfort to us all. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to move to these are that was so amazing. Um, so wonderful. But we're going to move to um, a wider Q and A now. So if anyone has any burning questions that they want to ask Owen, um, would you mind putting up your hand or using the little hands up? Um, oh yeah, cool. Ella, go ahead. Hi. Um, so I was just one. The stories are like so specific. So. Was your family like the main source of information when you were writing the book or did you have to go off and do separate like personal research on, of the stories? Um, That's a really good question. So most of the stories um, would have been within the family. So they're in my head. So when it comes to, to writing and recording them, I felt like I was cheating because I grew up with them. No, it's funny I sit down and I think these new ideas. I'm like going, I have them. Someone give them to me, great. But what I did do is I did go looking through some of the archives and for other versions. So um, majority of the stories in the book aren't found elsewhere. So mm -hmm. I thought if I were to take the book, like the story of Ermid is, Ermid would be far more uh, well-known one. The other versions aren't, but I thought if I'm adding something to, to the literary base about travelers, I want something to be new and fresh. I don't want to be repeating some analysis and then it creates this like conflicting narrative. I just go like, we have so much. I'd rather share stuff that people haven't had a glimpse of rather than if they had. Um, so mm -hmm. I, did, I did, I spent a good bit of time but I've been doing that for years and anyway, it was going through some of the kind of the archives and the recordings. And there's, 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 there's even a questionnaire from 1953 called the Irish Tinker Questionnaire, which there's loads of stories collected about, um, about us from the settled community. Um, and like, and th there was tales coming up, but none of them matched the ones I, I that were coming up in the book. And I found that really interesting because if you are going to share things, do you, do you necessarily want to start off sharing stuff that people may have know, or do you want to share something they've never talked about in the first place? And I just thought fresh land might be far more fertile than land that had been well, that's been well trodden. Okay, yeah, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you, and thanks for the question. <laughs> thanks, Ella. Evie, yeah, do you have a question? Um, just about at the start of your book, hi, you hi. said um, Gavin was kind of being used more. Mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of wondering, is that, is it used like every day in the yeah, traveling? So we, we use it intermittently, and um, I can sit down and have a full conversation in Gaelic, as such with older generations, but they're, 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 our language comes with a very unusual history, so it's, it's being recognised by, even by UNESCO as a protected asset. Um, it should be recognised as an Irish language, because even on the, on the 1st of March 2017, when the Irish state first began, the, uh, I suppose, the distinction of, um, of the denial of our ethnicity, because I think most people don't realise that in 1963, we had this thing called Irish Never Report, which was launched by Charlie Hawhey, who later became president. And he, in the report, this, which is 20 years of Nazi Germany, which is very disturbing, um, he called, he used the line of final solution. And so there was no final until we were absorbed into the country. So the, up until 2017, the Irish state had a very systematically engaged with us to make us settle people. And what happens is that a lot of errors things happen, like things like, um, there's a lot of genetic studies, including some I was involved in, in order to prove we're ethnically different. And that scares me because I don't believe in, in genetic um, absolutism. I think anyone can, can be a part of our community, not necessarily a traveler, but you can be a part of the community. So I started work, getting worried about like, genes and genetics and the whole narrative. Um, and one of the other sides was our language. So our language was used very openly, and there's poems in our language, there's songs in our language, there's proverbs, there's sayings, there's even insults. Like my favorite insults translates as, 
may your child be born with your face. And that is amazing because if you get upset, you just call yourself ugly. You have just called yourself ugly. Yeah. And I, and I think that is so curious. And um, so, so the language will be used very openly. And then many people in the wider community use bits of our language that relies on. Mostly they don't use it in a derogatory term. So I never get upset. Like the word Bjor, Fiend, the word Gammy, um, the, um, the word moniker, which is a legal term that means name. Um, the uh, bloke, one of our language, no words. Uh, lush, one of our words. No, so there's all, and no languages in Ireland. So there's all this intermixing anyways, and things change. And our, our syntax was highly invested in the Irish structure. And now it's from a very English structure. Um, but it would be used quite openly. And even just saying, like, some language was saying, like, um, Krishna Grupa, uh, you always say, like, I'm going to the shop. And so it, it, it would come out naturally. So when I, was, when I was inscribing the book, I wanted it to come out as I was actually saying it. So there's words in the book that are not in the glossary. Um, because I just thought, if you don't get it, you need to reread it. Um, but also because it's so obvious. But also, there is sensitivity around people call our language secret language, it's far from secret. It's just a very private, internalized, used language. Like I have 11 dictionaries. If you want to find stuff around uh, Gammon Kant, you can, it's usually on, it's found in the world of academia under the title Shelta, um, which is not a term we use. But there's, there's, I mean, there's dictionaries all over the place. Um, but people have used it in a very, I suppose, crypto linguistic way. It was used to start, people start using it to protect themselves. So if you're in a, uh, I suppose, a high population area, you feel socially, you feel, um, quite restricted, you feel endangered, you don't have any social power, you create a narrative with people around you to understand you, to protect you from the, your information from the wider world, which becomes even more important to those generations who had lower levels of literacy. So the ability to speak to people openly um, in a way that other tribes can hear them without on the, for the wider population understanding them, especially if you're an active uh, agent of oppression, um, it, it's actually essential. And that, that has survived in the current state. But also a lot of our younger generation are using it now. Like statements like Minkara Sports, which means travelers rising or empowerment of travelers. So, so those lang the languages are starting to come back into, into movement. We even have um, an organization called Minkara Widen, and Minkara Widen means like travelers chatting, but there's no direct conversation to chat in the way travelers chat because our language structure is called an interlacing language structure. So um, I, I always find it very popular that people take turns, and they're very polite um, within the wider community around conversation. Travelers often have three conversations at the same time, and it's not considered rude. There's this idea of like, in, like if you're not really interrupting people, you're just in, interjecting. Because if you're sitting there and we're just staring, like, not you, it's because obviously it's being recorded. So if I'm just staring at each other and someone's telling me a story, and I don't say anything back to them, they think I'm being quite rude. So they go, like, uh huh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you throw an idea of what happened next, and you're interrupting them all the time because you're an active agent in the conversation within the community, and um, and that's part of our language as well. Um, but also, there's parts of language I find quite sad. Um, like for example, no one people would say they go out on a Friday night. We say we get in because people don't always have access to social space. Um, you know, so there's, there's different ways our language has turned and been created because of the wider narrative. But I think it's it's an incredibly beautiful heritage. But it's not just a Trevor heritage or I mean Kerry. It's a part of the wider Irish movement and the wider collective. And when I was very young, um, coming out as a gay man, being of the Trevor community. There is a language called Polari that was used in England um, among members of the LGBT community. And there's large parts of that language are gammon. You know, so, you know, and so I was able to chat kind of going, this was evidence for me as a young person to say, ah, there's actual proof here that there was other LGBT travelers because there's a language which is very well recorded called Polari that has evidence in words that we use that come from our community. And I think that kind of interlacing that kind of connection was a great empowerment to myself. But also great peace. It also shows that the language is a living language rather than what is often described as a dead one. Wow, I hope that's, that a, that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Thomas, I you have your hand raised, but I don't know if you can um, ask your question. Uh, yeah, sorry, I just turned off the video because it was cool. slowing. Okay. I was just wondering, um, would you have a favorite place to write some authors like writing in cafes oh Did you have, like a particular actually, spot yeah um it, it changes depending on the season and the reason why is that in winter i will wrap myself up like a cocoon and be on the sofa with a laptop which is very bad for your posture but another sense of just lying there like give us envision those kind of victorian women in the, in the portrait just lying down ready for grapes 
just imagine that it's great to have a laptop. That is just divine because they're in a place of comfort. Um, I find it very difficult to write in public spaces. I spend a lot of time on trains. I go to, I go to visit my family and go away quite often. I'm currently living in South Dublin, but pre the whole COVID kind of situation. And um, I, I, I have to say that other noise and distractions I'd be very sensitive to because some people say I'm curious. I don't believe that. I'm nosy. So if I'm on a train and there's a conversation to down me, I want to listen. I want to hear what's going on. Someone's on the phone. What's happening? Yeah. And then so, so if you're in public spaces, I'm not going to write. I'm not going, who is she talking to? What's she doing? Is she shopping? What's she buying? Yeah. And, um, and I, I think that's, that's just natural. But yeah, so public distractions come very easy to me. So it's usually uh, solitary writing, uh, but somewhere that I'm comfortable. And um, like, I have to be having fun. You know, like, I, like, again, I, I know some people are very structured in the, like, I often, um, like, Maeve Inchie, oh my God, like, that woman would literally converted her attic, would spend hours in her attic every day writing. And I'm thinking, fair play to you, but that kind of sounds like prison, you know? Um, but it, that was what she needed to do to get her art out, you know? I and mean, that's how she created her art. And she gave her kind of the, the fertility of her mind. And I'm going, no, 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 I, I would find that absolutely painful. So, uh, often what happens is that things like this, my, like journals I bring with me, um, I'm in, waiting in line for something, I it like breaks, that kind of the idea, to talk, act or something. Because um, I think that the hardest part of most people find about writing, and anyone won't think about writing, is just write. Literally, write it. Go back and edit it later, like do all the things you want to do it later, just get it on the paper, get it done. Because if you're sitting there going, I want to say this, and I want to say that, and I want to then this is going to happen. It's not going to happen because you're there going like this rather than like this. So like I think they're going, if you need to write, just do it. If you want to create, just do it. If you want to record it, if you want to think it, go do it. But at least that you're doing it. Um, yeah, but I think that my, my favorite place to do it is places that I'm comfortable. Um, because I, I don't think I would ever and hopefully will never be in a position of agonizing um over work. That's why I the work that I do do. So I've, I've done like been like essays for years and writing is like they've always brought me joy. And I know that's not the best. Um, I suppose platform for when you were hoping to, I suppose, extend yourself as a more kind of temporary wider within the genres of writing. But I think it's a necessity for myself to make sure that I have fun. Um, because I think it's, a, it's part of the creative process is to have joy to yourself. And if people are going to engage with your work, they, they should know that you have not bled into the paper, you know, that you've actually enjoyed sharing the story with them. Because if you're bleeding into the paper, do you really want to tell that story? Um, yeah. So I think if I'm comfortable and happy, sure, I'd be. I'd be I'd, I will be left away. So that's hence early mornings, late nights, when we're all cozy, that's when I'm on fire. Thank you for the Thank question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Akino, raise your hand. There. Oh yeah, I just have uh, one question. As a queer ethnic minority living in Ireland myself, um, <laughs> oh, sorry, <I'm> um, <laughs> like, do you have any advice just for like, Obviously, most of us here are writers, but do you have any advice for just young people in general? Like, it is a really hard, like, world at the moment, even for mm -hmm. queer people, people of color, ethnic minorities. Like, do you just have any advice? Um, well, two things have always brought me comfort, especially it being in a world that has very rarely ever reflected that, right? Uh, is one, become a member of your local library and ask them to order all the books that you can ask them to order. Hound them, write them, say it's part of the World Bank. They're free for you. You can get these books from like, I don't have it. You can get it. You trust me. It's out there. You can order it. And, and they have reserves to order. So I think go find those books, but read everything. And the more diverse we read, the more we realize that we're, we're not so alone. We're just different and everybody's different. And, you know, and it, just, it just seems to be how prominent that difference is seen in the world. Um, but sometimes we think that this is, this is I mean, like, grew up as a, a gay traveler, my gosh. Like, um, and also from a very unusual family, like my elder brother's name, was born in the late 70s in the west of Ireland. It was called Darrell. Like they didn't leave, they did not leave the ground easy for him, you know, when there was Thomas's the Martins at every corner. I mean, I couldn't turn the corner without finding the Mary. I think it's probably three of them in the back of my sofa. Um, so, so we're always on the edge, and that creates any sort of difference people will often associate with pain. And as life goes on, that difference actually becomes an armor of power because um because you, you start to realizing that it can be incredibly powerful. Also, you can find allies in that. And within the written word, I think I read books in my youth that absolutely near traumatized me um, in the, the hatred and ideas and ideologies around travelers um, and community and the, the queer community, the LGBT, 
and looking back and kind of going, I needed, I needed to have that understanding because I need to know where people are coming from and why they were saying certain things and why they thought certain things and where did the ideology come from. And, like, and it's not about my ideology is better than yours and yours is wrong and I'm right. Kind of going, we seriously need to have a conversation because neither of us are going away. Well, we're here. So I'm not going to just like, disappear. And I often find that it actually exists even now around cancel culture. I am fascinated with cancel culture because I'm always wondering, going, where are these people going? Is there a cancel island they all move off to live on? Did they move to a cancel island? Um, and I'm kind of going, like, they're still there. Like, and like, do you just want to push them further and you never talk again? So people need to be pushed back and go, this is appropriate, that's inappropriate. But sending people to, to, to cancel island is bizarre because they just number each other, they, they forge new allies among each other, and you don't get to speak anymore. You know? And I think that one of the biggest things that social media and the living world has brought to me is that if we look back into earlier times, there's all the sense of like people used to speak so respectfully to each other. It's like, it is now. Rich people spoke to rich people, and the articles in the newspaper were written by rich people or people who influence. And all, the, all these narratives are about people of power and people within that power. And people of lesser power didn't really mingle that very much. But go on. Here we are now. You can talk to anybody anywhere. And um, the amount of people who in their lives have no travelers in their lives in a physical sense can connect with our community very easily now, which means you can start having those discussions. And I think the more diverse we are with our reading, the more critical we are. And then I don't think critical is kind of giving out kind of like human language, kind of like, kind of like the national want to say now, but no, the kind of like the crude stuff like, oh, I just met them kind of going, how the living kind of going, what were they actually trying to say to me? And am I picking it up or am I just drifting on my own stuff? So I think sometimes that when we're, especially myself, when I'm reading, um, I'm reading from part of, am I responding to the actual work or am I responding to my trauma that I see about the work? It's not actually in the book at all. No, so it's all this kind of stuff. Because no, someone like, was, I read this book once before, there was one lovely book. Actually, no, I'm going to change it now. Do you know the Molly Malone statue in Dublin? No, the Molly, it's just, you know, I hate that statue. Right? And it's not the statue itself. It's bronze, it has no feelings towards me. I know it's not personal. It's that every time I pass that statue, the breasts are here are all polished and the rest of it's dull. And they go, can we have a conversation about how people are in public are like rubbing a statue of a woman's breast? You know, like, can we have this like this conversation? And no one does because it's not a real woman. Like, it's actually a statue. Don't forget to set about a statue. I'm going, I know that, but they're kind of going, what's it say? What's it telling them? What, what like narratives are we sharing? I think that's the same with books. They were going, sometimes we can, we, people can have the conversation. Other times it's just enough to ask. Did you see that statue? Did you walk by that? Do you not realize how the breasts are all shiny, the rest of it is dull, and no one seems to care? Do you think there might be some sort of subcontext going on of how people don't really understand like the body of women and or you know, that? No. And I kind of go, and some people will go, that is mortifying. You know, and other people go, no, no, it's a statue. And you go, and that's fine, but can we just have the conversation? And I think what happens often is that reading genres and books you wouldn't normally be open to. Um, it can be so blowing my mind like this like there's, there's a fiscal party at the moment they're running in um in um south dublin for the local by-election their politics would not land with my pockets anyway they're revisioning of ireland and we're returning to the good old times that never existed um but their material fascinating i'm going you have told yourself a new story and i need to know that story because when we're talking to each other uh, i want to understand where you're coming from and I won't get that if I haven't read your story. So I think having that openness is very important. But also it brings out more comfort that the world is strange, but we're also strange. And in, in the world being strange and us being strange, everything's normal. I like that. That's cool. Yeah. I do. I like that very much. Um, we have time for maybe one more question, if anyone has a final one. Yeah, Sarah, go for it. Hi Owen, I just wanted to ask, I know yeah. you won two awards at the Children's Books Island Awards this year, I just wanted to know how that experience was like for you. Okay, oh, they're mortifying. Um, did anyone watch the video, or happen to come across the video in which I won the award? Right, so I was asked to go to a meeting around, oh, this is what we're going to do on the day, right? And I'm like, okay, I'll go to that. And this is going to be the sequence that's going to happen. So, so turn up to this meeting. And everybody in the video was very well dressed. And I'm going, Thursday evening, they might be going somewhere. They all look suspiciously well dressed. I'm just in from work. Um, because I have long hair. I'm like, is the hair brushed? I don't know. So they eventually they tell me, oh, you won this award and you won this award. And like in my mind, I'm going, I had a underreaction. So there's a time going, thank you, or, or thank you so much. Yeah, that sounds nice. When I, and then I wanted to redo the video. They said, no, no, don't do the video. You can't redo it. You won't be authentic. I saw the video. I was jumping. I'm like, 
you know, so in my mind, I was like, Ooh, if you ask me, I afterwards said to my partner, Dad, I was like, going, oh, I must have come across so rude. Like I was so under energy. I was like, thank you. And um, I look forward to sharing people. And that was not my, that was not what I was experiencing. But also like with things like, like A, I thought being nominated was enough. I thought the first I'm nominated because when I, when I was doing the book, I thought I was making this small little paper bird that was going to stop into the world, you know, and see where she flew. And I was not expecting her to come home and it. I just thought, it was cool. Have, have a good time. Um, and then all of a sudden there's all these like, connections and like you're reading it in book clubs and you're kind of going, let's talk about it and going, well, I was expecting it. It most certainly wasn't, I thought being nominated was amazing. When I won one award, I thought, oh, shocker. I right. won, then won the second award and I go, and then someone told me that I'm the first person in over 15 years with two awards. And I go, I met it now. Yeah, I met this. And I, go, I think we, I, I think sometimes when people win awards, it's like, there's a sense of like, respond very measured. You know, and I was like, I was like yeah. And um, yeah, so I was like, I don't, I, I, I was trying to find like an emoji gift or the other day that would, like, would be described like that. Couldn't, could not find the reaction of, but I thought in my mind of, oh, that's nice and lovely. So the little fireworks are going off on screen that I was totally aware of. Um, yeah, so I was absolutely delighted. I, the fact that it was, and, and KBG and the Children's Book um, Ireland have a really interesting process is that they don't influence the process. It actually is a jury. And so it's actually people who have read the book and enjoyed the book. And so sometimes they always kind of feel when awards can be very political. Do you know, like the idea of like, oh, no, we need to give this person an award because this year's team is like diversity. Like, let's give the person over here an award because it's, you know, and they like, no, it was actually children who enjoy and young people who enjoyed reading and young adults who enjoyed reading the book and thought, I find it decent, decent, and I find it decent enough to give it like a tick. So it goes off. And yeah, so it was, it was something that, that brings me a lot of joy to know that something that I, I would have adored as a child growing up myself or a younger person. Because I'm saying child, and I don't like, that's only happened with awards because a, a good story should be universal. And I wrote the book for everybody. Because they're not actually, it's not age limited. Because like anyone of any age, if you're like, if you're eight or you're 18, the book should be open to you. And I think now in my mind, it's sliding towards younger people because of an award when it's actually all you bring back. Also, believe it or not, I won a European award on sci fi that I had no idea why. Because, um, you know, but there's a, there's a different version of sci fi than I thought in my head. No, 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 trust me. I was, in my mind, sci fi is like space, techno, I'm going, it ain't men turn into trees. I mean, you know, but apparently there's a, there's a whole different genre sitting there that I can get. Um, yeah, so I, I think even now, um, as you can tell by me rabbiting on, I still in wonder of it. I, the, the trophies are real bronze. So I polished them enough. That I'm just, they walk into them almost blinded. Um, yeah, so absolutely delighted to not only to be nominated, but to win them, but to win them in a, which a way that I feel is very authentic rather than just a gesture of them. And I think that, that for me, Kind of me, me has a reason that my work is seen as work and not the work of a traveler, you know. Because, like, I because when I started first, I just wanted to write stuff, I didn't want to write stuff about travelers, actually, very resistant around it. Because, what do travelers do? We talk about travelers, you know. And then you kind of go, like, that, that, that's just one part of me, the, the whole facet and rainbow of who I am and aspect. And um, but it, it was the book that wanted to be written, and it was the book that wanted to be heard, and it was the one that people ha happened to find and to enjoy. And I think those combination of those factors. Sure, how could you ask for more? So thank, thank you very much, Dr. Thank you so much. Thank you, that was so wonderful. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, and and answering... yourself, it's a shared conversation. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that is true. That is true. Um, so yeah, if everyone wants to like unmute and just say a big thank you before we cut the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.